relationship. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once a who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless above reproach in his sight. If, you indeed, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister, I now, reckon, no, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body which is in the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them... God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Amen. Father, we, we thank you for the truth. We thank you that the truth has set us free. We thank you, Lord, for the truth about your Son, who is the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, and who is supreme above every other being. We thank you, Lord, that you have revealed Christ to us and you have given us the privilege of preaching Christ crucified, risen and glorified in this world. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Um, many years ago, it would be about 25, 27 years ago, I was pastoring the church in, in England, in uh, Swindon, in the southwest of England. And uh, I suppose when you're not the pastor, you, you wonder a lot of things about the pastor. And I think she, uh, this lady, who was a very good friend of mine, I think she uh, assumed <coughs> that every week, around Tuesday or Wednesday, the Holy Spirit would just come and visit me and anoint me in the most 
one for why and tell me exactly what I had to preach. Um, and uh, if only that were true, uh, it would save a lot of work. Uh, but that was her, her impression. And so one day she came with um, obviously something that was a little bit of a worry at the back of her head. And she said to me after service, she said, um, <clears throat> Pastor, um, what would you do um, if the Holy Spirit never came and anointed you in the week to prepare this special message for the church? What would you, what would you preach on? And um, normally I have no idea how to answer questions, but um, I, I just said to this lady, and I said, well, when I do not get this anointing of the Holy Spirit beforehand, I preach Christ. I said, because we cannot go wrong if we preach Christ. Even if we don't feel goosebumps or... We don't feel that God has given us a particular anointing. Preach Christ. Preach Him. Because that way we're going to glorify Christ and we're going to glorify God. And that was my answer to her. Not that the question was a particularly accurate one. Um, I think the times when I have got goosebumps on a Tuesday um, and been given, you know, a, a wonderful inspiration by God of what to preach are few and far between. And so today we are going to play safe. We're going to preach Christ. And we're going to preach the supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we have read, uh, Megan has read two uh, wonderful and classic um, Bible readings that show the supremacy of Christ, the supremacy of his being above every other being, the supremacy of his nature, the supremacy of his work. Also a verse in Colossians 3 and verse 16, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16 Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This was something that um, Alex uh, rightly reminded us of um, when we are singing, whether it's hymns or whether it's psalms but it's spiritual songs. The need to sing these songs when it is relevant with thankfulness and uh, um, a joy in our hearts to God. There are times when we will read, uh, uh, when we will be singing a hymn or a, or a psalm, when we will be convicted by those words, when those words will um, maybe not bring us to great joy and thankfulness to God, but um, it, it should have an effect that the words that we sing will reach our hearts and touch our emotions and touch our feelings. Many years ago I visited, a, it wasn't a massive church, it was a, um, a Pentecostal church in, in, in Barking, and um, that's in East London by the way, um, it's not a dog, um, it's, um, it's in East London. And I used to visit this church now and again because um, I was involved in a pioneer work and it was really good to, to go to this church uh, which uh, was a vibrant church, a church to the nations, a church with many converted um, Pakistanis and, and Turkish Muslims. And um, one of the things I loved about this church was the singing. They sang hymns, it was before contemporary worship, but when they sang hymns in that church, I think that when they built the church, they must have nailed that roof down really hard because they almost lifted the roof 
off of the building. It was such great joy. It was such passion. It was such thanksgiving to, to God. And that is how we should sing our songs. That is why it is important to choose songs that have great words about God, great words about the Trinity, great words about the Saviour, great words about the Father, so that we're singing with thankfulness in our hearts and not singing uh, just a, a cliche after cliche um, or a song that, um, you know, it's just all about us and doesn't have this, 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 Praise and worship to God. The supremacy of Christ. And Colossians 1 is a, it's a hymn of praise to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we should be spending our lives looking forward to that day. Um, and um, a lot of our, our older songs uh, looking forward to, to that day when we will meet him in heaven. That day when with glorified bodies we will meet our glorified Christ. And the worship that we read about in Revelation and the worship that we read about that is going on in heaven will, will be our worship and we look forward to that day. The day when the Lord Jesus Christ will have the final and the ultimate, the supremacy, which is promised throughout the New Testament. When at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. That hasn't happened yet, but it will happen one day. When every knee shall bow before Jesus Christ in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And God be praised for every brother and sister who will be able to bow that knee, not in fear, not in condemnation, not in judgment, but in absolute worship of the supremacy of Christ. Isaac Watts wrote many great hymns and one of his great hymns uh, begins, Jesus shall reign wherever the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. Jesus shall reign where the sun shore to shore throughout all eternity. The glory of God's word is that it so often has a present as well as a future application. And there are many great blessings, many great prophecies, many great psalms, many great promises that have a word to us in the present but also, and often much greater meaning, a word that has a future application. And we look forward, as every saint does, to a time when the supremacy of Christ will be perfect and absolute, as Christ reigns throughout all eternity, as the Lamb who was slain is now the Lamb upon the throne. One of the great um, uh, voices we find in the book of Revelation. This is the lamb that was slain. He's now the lamb upon the throne. And we will know that supremacy, that ultimate supremacy of Christ, and we will rejoice in it. We will live in it throughout all eternity. But we also know the supremacy of Christ here and now in our lives and in our church. And it is this we must preach. We preach Christ crucified. 
We preach the cross. We preach that God was clothed in human flesh. I went to the cross I paid the price for our sins. But the cross just shows the supremacy of Christ that Hebrews speaks so much about. The sacrifice, the cross, the crucified Saviour speaks of the supremacy of Christ because there was no other sacrifice found in heaven or on the earth that could take away the sin of a man and the sin of a woman. And therefore, the cross speaks of the supremacy of Jesus Christ and we know that in our lives and we must preach it with our lives. And the word supremacy simply means holding the first place. Holding the first place. I remember as a young Christian in an evangelical church where um, visiting speakers would often speak about Christ having the first place in our lives. It was a theme that they came back to time and time again. And maybe we did feel, uh, just on occasions, that the preacher was getting at us. We need to return to at least some of that kind of preaching. We, we seem unable in our, in our lives and in our churches to, to ever hold a balance. You know, we're like a pendulum swinging from one side to the other. Um, one minute it's it's all about um, uh, you know uh, not condemnation, but it, it it is all about getting our lives into into shape and um, and it, it's sermons full of conviction and challenge and everything, and we we need that, but also we need to declare the greatness of Jesus Christ and to declare our joy in Jesus Christ. We must keep that balance of challenge and never being satisfied and always being called forward by church leaders to a greater walk with God, to a, a closer walk with, with the Lord. But at the same time, it doesn't become a kind of a negative uh, ditch where we forget the glory of Christ, the glory that Christ has brought us into through his death and resurrection and, uh, and the call that God has given to us, the command that we have to rejoice in the Lord, to, to be thankful to the Lord and to make our lives a song of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. So it isn't easy to hold that balance but supremacy simply means that Christ holds the first place. We're not thinking here of the supremacy of one Bible truth over another, another Bible truth or one set of Bible doctrines over another set of Bible doctrines. We're not thinking of one church supreme over another church or one denomination better than another denomination or one creed better than another creed as was so um, correctly um, uh, said in the, the video, um, you know, we can argue until, well, months and years about these things. Which is supreme? Which is the supreme denomination? Which is the, which is the supreme creed? Is it the Baptist one? Is it the Westminster Confession? Which creed is the greatest? That's not what we are looking at here. We're talking about the supremacy of a being. We are declaring that one person is supreme over every other person. We are saying that Christ is the supreme one. He is supreme over every man, every woman, every angel, every created being. He is supreme. And so we are declaring that one person is supreme over every every other and this person is the Lord Jesus Christ and it is concerned with his supremacy over us 
He is supreme over us. So when we speak of the supremacy of Christ, we mean Christ occupying that first place in our life, in our home, in our business, in our friendships, in our pleasures, and in our interests. The supremacy of Christ in my life, in my home, in my business, in my friendships, in my pleasures, in my interests. And what this means is that we can go through this church, go through this life, our home, our work, our place of education, and we can take Christ with us. And it means that we can take Christ into our business, Christ into our friendships, Christ into our pleasures. And we don't have to be strange or weird or, or different in that way. Um, I believe that um, we should be extremely popular. I know that there is another side to this, but, but uh, I believe that when we are with a group of friends who maybe, uh, you know, they don't believe the same thing as, as, as we do, but we're not going to come and condemn them every sentence or, 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 or every, you know, every time we meet, but they will see that we are different. They will see that we don't do the things that, that they do. They will see that we don't use the words that they would. They, they will see that we, 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 we don't use foul language, that, um, that, that we don't keep condemning, that we're not negative, we, we're, we're positive, and yet at the same time we're taking a stand all the time for the absolute supremacy of Jesus Christ. And there will be times when they won't understand. There will come to be times when even people closest won't quite understand why we why we believe this and why we are you know uh, why we cannot accept that. But at the same time, they will respect us very very often. It is not there are not many people who will persecute you simply because of your love for Jesus Christ. They are found and they are there. But most people will respect us if Christ is supreme. There is only one person who has the right to be supreme in our lives. Only one person in the whole universe has the absolute right to occupy, occupy the first place in your life and in mine. Other people may try to occupy that first place in your life, but it is not their right to seek it or obtain it. There may be other people, strong friends, strong personalities, who will try to occupy that first place in your life. I, uh, do you have to go to church today? You know, I mean, can't we just, can't we just go and have a pizza and, and enjoy ourselves? Do you have to be so fanatical? Do you have to go to church? <coughs> Other people. The devil seeks to have first place in our lives, but it's not his right to have it either. He has no right over the life of a Christian. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has the right to rule and reign supremely over our lives. And if there was no other reason than this, it's simply because He made us. We would not exist if Christ was not supreme. He made us. Colossians 1.16, we've read, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. We were not only made by him, we were made for him. All things were made for him. 
He made us in order that he might be first in our hearts and in our lives. He made us so that we might love him and serve him. He is the creator. And so he should be supreme in my life because he made us. That doesn't mean that we can't have interest. It doesn't mean that we, 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 we can't um, you know, enjoy the great things in this life. Not the sinful things in this life, but the good things in this life. He's our creator. And we were looking um, a few weeks ago, well, a few months ago now I think, uh, about being made in the image of God. And he's made us with this creativity. He's made us with the, this, this, this wonderful ability to, you know, to make music and, 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 to, you know, uh, and to be artistic. And, and you know, we, we, we have been made for, for more than just limiting our created life to um, a, a service in, in the church on Sunday at 4.30. He's made us and he created us and, and Christ has created the human race in such a way that we can actually enjoy many of the things. A redeemed sense of humour. A redeemed sense of what is right and wrong. A redeemed sense of what is healthy and unhealthy. A redeemed sense of what is balanced and what is unbalanced. Many of us enjoy some form of sport. Many of us enjoy music. Many of us enjoy nature. Many of us are, um, are, are athletic. Many of us can use uh, our minds and, and our understanding and, our, and the way that we are, are, are created to, uh, to create ourselves and enjoy that in a good way. But we were not only made by him, we were made for him. And so he has to have the supremacy in, in every area of our lives. The Christian life is not a lot of do-nots. Don't do this and don't do that and don't think this and don't think that. Um, you know, there, 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 there is a restriction. Obviously, we, 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 we self-impose restrictions on ourselves. We have the Bible uh, as, a, as, a, as a great guideline for our lives. But our lives are not meant to be some kind of legalistic um, living. But he has made us to love him and to serve him. He made us in order that he might be first in our hearts and in our lives. And outside of that there is a whole glory of things to be appreciated and, and loved. We can love our wives and our husbands in, you know, we're, we're, in, 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 in sacrificial ways. We can love our children as we are, are called by the Bible to love our children. Husbands, love your wives as Christ. Love the church and died for the church. And wives are basically to do the same. We won't go into the obedience and submission at the moment. But, uh, but we are meant to love one another. Sacrificially, as Christ loved the church. And then we are to love our children and our grandchildren and our parents and, 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 and these wonderful relations that we, we have. But we are to give him the first place in our lives. He's supreme because he made us. But then, he's supreme because not only has he created us, but he has redeemed us. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us 
from the domain or the dominion of darkness and transferred, I like the word translated, us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He redeemed us. We now belong to Christ because he has purchased us with his own blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20 has been a challenge for me ever since I heard it preached on um, at a mission conference very shortly, just a few months after I was saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, you were bought with a price. You were bought with a price. And Paul teaches me and challenges me that I don't live for myself. I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. And Peter writes in 1 Peter and chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And that is a wonderful uh, two verses here. You were ransomed from those futile ways, from those sinful ways you inherited from your forefathers and their forefathers and going back to the sin of Adam. You were ransomed, you were bought, you were, you were bought free, not with perishable things such as silver or gold whereby we might lose what we have been given, but we were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. We have been ransomed with the most powerful ransom in the whole universe, the powerful and the almighty blood of Jesus Christ. We have sung, men have composed great songs about the blood of Jesus. There is power, there is power, there is wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. And we were ransomed with this blood. It is supreme. And through his infinite sacrifice upon Calvary's cross and by the mighty power of the resurrection, God has rescued us, rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son. He loves. We have been brought into the kingdom of God's Son. And therefore the question is, is Christ my King? Because I have been redeemed. And He is supreme because He is my Redeemer. He is supreme because God the Father has given Him the, the supremacy. Let us read Colossians 1, 15 to 20 again. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God. The exact likeness. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him, he's the first ever to risen from the dead. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, he might be preeminent, we could say, in everything he might be supreme. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, made by the blood of his cross. He has reconciled all things because he is supreme. And according to these verses, Christ has supremacy in likeness, in power, in creation, in eternity, in authority, in the church, 
in the new creation, in riches and in final victory. In Matthew chapter 12, our Lord declares his supremacy by saying that he is greater than the temple in verse 6. He's greater than the Sabbath, this Jewish holy um, day, so serious, so solemn. But Christ is supreme, he's greater than the Sabbath, verse 8. He's greater than the devil, verse 29. Greater than Jonah, verse 41. Greater than Solomon, verse 42. Christ has supremacy over everything and everyone. We are saved by grace. Through faith in Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace. We are kept by grace. We are kept through grace. And Christ is a magnificent redeemer. His blood is more powerful than anything in the universe. It's more powerful than our original sin and our sinful nature because we are redeemed. But now in our redeemed body, not our glorified body, but, but uh, you know we, we are redeemed believers in Jesus Christ. That grace works every day through our lives. And that is a wonderful truth. Because in all honesty, and looking at my own life, particularly, though it is right of the Lord, it is right to occupy that first place in my life, it is right for Him to be supreme in my life. He's not always supreme. Because even though we are born again believers, very often it is self that reigns supreme over our lives. And where self is reigning, the Lord will not reign supreme in our lives. The Lord will not share His glory with anyone, least of all sin and self. But it does not mean that He's turned His back on us. And it doesn't mean that His grace is not sufficient for us every day. It doesn't mean that the truth is no longer true, that where sin abounds, grace, grace does abound even more. But what it does mean is that we know that at those times we are not enjoying the Lord as we should. At those times we will need Alex on every hymn to remind us to be joyful and thanksgiving to the Lord. Because we are not allowing the sovereign God to be supreme in our lives. And, you know, as was well answered in the video, it isn't that God doesn't have this authority, it isn't that He, he doesn't have, have this power. But it is simply that he will not reign sufficiently for us if our lives are not given over to him in the way that he is commanded by Paul to be supreme in our lives. But it doesn't mean that Christ is not in our life. It just means that he's not always occupying that first place that he has the right to do. We are Christians. Christ is present. We know that we are saved and we know that no one will be able to snatch you out of the Father's hand or out of the hand of Jesus because the Word of God declares it. For we are safe and secure and we're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not by our works. Not by our redeemed works. Christ is indeed present. And others recognise this. There is no doubt that Christ lives in you and that Christ is present in you. But is Christ supreme in me? Or is he just present 
in my life. The call is, is to be supreme in my life. But the wonderful mercy and grace of God means that um, we are His. And people recognise that. I recognise it when um, you know, a question is asked or I see a uh, you know, I see a message on Facebook and, 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 and I see that the Lord is dwelling in that person's life. And although I would never be able to judge how supreme God is dwelling in that person's life, I know that there is the presence of God in that life. I know that Christ is indeed present in that life. So the, the question is, is not is... Is Christ present? Yes, He is, and you will not lose that presence of God. And you will be accepted by God on that, that final day of the Lord. But is Christ supreme? It doesn't mean that we are perfect ever. Neither does it mean that we have no other love in our lives. It is a wonderful mark of a, a woman or a man of God who has love enough for, 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 for as many people as come into that person's life. We are expected and commanded to love our parents and our wives and our husbands and our children, grandchildren, brothers, sisters and our neighbour as ourselves. But if Christ is ruling supremely over our lives, we will have a supreme love for his person. A supreme love for his presence. We love Christ more than any other person or thing. More than our ministry. More than our gifting. More than ourselves. The Lord asked us the same question. He asked Peter in John 21, 15. Do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than these? It doesn't mean do you, do you, do you not love these. It doesn't mean that we're not to have a love for these. But to, to, every, to every believer, Christ asks, is there anything you love more than me? And I believe that is not a, a desperately difficult question or an unfair question. Because I believe that when we truly know God, and we truly get every other relationship into, um, you know, into a balance, we will realise that there is no love like the love of God. I'd only been a Christian a few weeks and I was on the, um, on the streets witnessing. I think I, I only knew just about 1% more than the people I was witnessing to. But uh, I'm witnessing on, 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 the, on the, 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 the roads where, where I lived with, with Marilyn. We, we weren't married then, it was just a, a couple of months before we, got, we were married. And, um, you know, um, people can come up with some very difficult questions. And, and I remember Marilyn and I, we were sat speaking about the, the love of God, that we to love Him um, with all our hearts, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. Probably didn't use those words because I probably didn't know that scripture, but that was the kind of thing we were saying. And uh, and then the question was put to Marilyn, you know, well, well, you know, um, if you have to love God that way, you know, how can you love um, your boyfriend or your, or your husband? And uh, and uh, it was a very it was a very good question. And uh, Marilyn answered it, and it's probably the best answer I've ever heard on, on this whole subject. Uh, probably better than many sermons. And she just said, well, I do love God. But he can't save me. He can't give me my salvation. You know, he, uh, she, Mary could love me for, for all, all my, my life, and all her life, and, and end up absent from God in hell. And, and that's the simplicity of it. We love Christ. Christ is supreme because no one and nothing else can save us. Only Christ can save us. Only Christ is worthy. Only Christ is supreme. 
Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, because as much as I love so many things, none of these things can save me. If Christ is ruling supremely, secondly, we will give unquestioning obedience to his commands. Our Lord teaches us in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you will keep my commands. That's a very um, wide um, command. But all the commands of God, they have very specifics. You know, there are the, the things that we can really see um, how we can obey the commands of Jesus. Because at the wedding at Cana that I nearly preached on today, maybe I'll preach on in a few weeks' time, but at the wedding at Cana, Mary gave an important and wonderful command concerning obedience to Christ. She didn't quite know what was going on herself. She just knew they'd run out of wine. Um, and Jesus had given her um, an answer that hadn't really helped in the situation. But Mary just said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And I haven't got a clue what, what's going on here. I just know we're out of wine and I've gone to my son to ask if he can help and I'm really not quite sure what he has in mind. But whatever it is, just do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. And that makes um, following the commandments of the Lord simple. I didn't say easy, I said simple. The simple is that I can understand it very simply. It's not complicated, it's not diffuse, it's not something that I need a thousand interpretations on. It's profound, but it's simple. Do whatever he tells you. And if he's supreme, that's what we will do. And thirdly and finally, we will have complete submission to his will. When the Lord Jesus occupies a supreme place in our lives, we will be willing to serve him in the sphere of his choice. To suffer should he will it. And to die for him if necessary. Now I'm 73 and coming up to for 74. And we heard just there of a, a young man of 34 in, in the best years of his life and probably had greater years to come. But the wonderful thing is that Christ was supreme for him. And he submitted to his will. I, I'm on the, you know, Facebook groups where great, wonderful brothers and sisters in the Lord uh, have lost loved ones. Lost wives, lost husbands. There are men who are asking prayer for stage four cancer. And, and, and yet, I'm so humble with their messages that are full of submission to the Lord. That I know the Lord can heal, but I'm so grateful that He's my Redeemer. And I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know where I am going. And I am so humbled by these men and women, some of them much younger than me, who have this wonderful, unquestioning obedience and submission to the will of God. To have a supreme love for his person. And as far as any human can, let us have unquestioning obedience to his commands and complete submission to his will. May he be supreme in our hearts now, in a relative way. He's not reigning supreme in any, supreme in any heart uh, here today, as he will reign supreme in our hearts throughout eternity. 
But while we are waiting for that wonderful, that terrible, but that glorious for his belief, for his uh, um, his, his children, that, that day of the Lord, that Christ reigns supreme in our hearts while we're here on this earth. And then when we do hear those wonderful words, well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Enter into the kingdom. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And then we will reign with him forever. We will rule with him forever. We will know no limits. No pain. No tears, no disappointment, no condemnation, no regrets. Throughout all eternity, we will reign with Christ. And yet, he will always be supreme. And we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.